in 1976, white America, in its gall, is planning to have its 200th birthday celebration. And I can tell you the unhappiness of the American Indian, if it's manifested in 1976, we will make sure that the white man has an unhappy birthday. Oh. Ah. I want everyone to look at me this day and also the mother earth. This land is mine. In 1868, he said, I want the full power to exercise my rights, which has been set down according to the Treaty of 1868. He said, upon the hill at the Tipi, we met. At that time, I said, the superintendent, who is in charge of the Indian reservation, should be removed. You promised me at that time that you will remove him. As I come into this hall, I saw him standing at the Wait. door. <clears throat> Let me straighten one thing out. On that day on the hill, I promised I would try to remove him. And I promised that I would try it, although I didn't know if I could do it. If you remember, that's exactly what I said to you that day. I remember the exact words you said to me at the time. You said you have power to remove the superintendent. I should have the power, and I want to tell you, tell Frank, that I tried to remove the superintendent, 
and I could not get it done. He said the people here are all in the uproar, don't know what, where they're going to get their next meal. They don't have no horses left, and the, the future just is not there for them. He said that he knows that there's a lot of money that comes into this reservation in the name of the people, but nobody knows where that money goes and our people are still poorer than ever. And that he's been eating so much rice that now his eyes are starting to slant. <laughs> John Collier and the New Deal gave us the government we have today. <laughs> And we have been in trouble ever since with all kinds of things. But if they really meant this business about these congressional hearings and this cleanup, I don't believe this would amount to anything. I really don't. Dick Wilson and the BIA, they don't want uh, the full bloods to be talking. They don't want the full bloods to tell anything, how they're being treated, how, how we're being harassed and so forth in this on this reservation. By the police, you mean? It's, it's mostly the goon squad scrambling around here. They're up to something. And uh, this black and white car belongs to Elmer Winters has been running up to this house and drives back to this house. And, and now he left and he just come around here and went through again and a police car went by. Whatever they're doing, I'm glad we're shaking them up. <laughs> did this uh, police force that we're talking about, what did you name them, by the way? I didn't name them. I think it was the press that named them the Goon Squad, them and Ames. But, uh, I mean, you you didn't give them a name yourself. They were called, I think, by our superintendent, an auxiliary force. I think every one of us is aware of what happened to the Bureau of Indian Affairs building in Washington back in November. At that time, a threat was made via telephone from Mr. Russell Means to the secretary of the Ogallala Sioux tribe, Toby Eaglebo, that they wanted to come into Billy Mills Hall here and hold a victory dance. We, of course, said no way. He responded in this way. He said, get your pigs together. We're coming in anyway, and we're going to take Billy Mills Hall, and we're going to use it. We're going to have our victory dance. Some monies was provided. By the agency? By the agency, yes, to hire a small group of people to protect our buildings, bureau office, Billy Mills Hall, the tribal offices. This group became branded as the Goon Squad, Dick Wilson's Goon Squad, his private police force. These people that were hired, Senator, were law-abiding citizens of this reservation, people that had jobs, many of them did. They didn't want the same thing happening here that happened in Washington. Uh, as far as them beating somebody up, I have no recollection of that ever happening. You never uh, ordered anybody to be beat up or roughed up? No, sir. If I uh, had that in mind, I'd do it myself, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, uh, do you know of any specific persons who have been harassed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police or the so-called goon squad or the auxiliary force? Well, I myself personally was harassed physically by the goon squad on February 27th. I was attacked. And I made this report to the FBI, by the way. Do uh, you know who attacked you? Yes. Uh, Glenn Three Stars. Uh, Joseph Marable, um, Winters,
got to recognize that the government ought to be concerned about everybody who lives within the confines of the United States. That concern has hurt us real badly in the last uh, 100 years or so. It's cost us, uh, let's see, some 100 and 124 million acres of land and about 30 years off our useful life. You know, we're a little tired of the government's concern. We think we can do better. I do want to find out eventually today, if I can, what led up to the occupation of Wounded Knee, how the American Indian movement got there. Well, the main reason was spiritual. We knew that Bigfoot and his band were there, and that that was the last major military engagement that took place between Indian peoples and the United States government. And the second reason, the first one being spiritual, the second one was the 1868 Sioux Treaty, which stated that every white person that did, or every non-Teton Sioux member that did not have the permission of, of us to come into western South Dakota were then acting illegally, and the United States government is supposed to remove them, whether by force or otherwise. And they had been failing to do this for 105 years. So we felt that beginning at Wounded Knee, we would start to physically evict every trespasser in Western South Dakota. Do you think that uh, uh, it's realistic that the terms of the 68 Treaty be entirely lived up to now, or do you think that... You know, everything I say and do has been said and done before me, and I'm only a mockingbird. I have nothing original to offer the, the elders. In fact, they have everything to offer me. And it is their feeling that those federal lands in the Black Hills can be returned to us, and the rest of the lands in western South Dakota that are not now in existing reservations could be leased out. Believe me, there would be no need for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. In realistic terms, uh, I would guess that what you'd do is start the Indian Wars all over again. If uh, you tried, for example, to tell somebody who bought land from somebody else. Personally, uh, I see nothing wrong with making refugees out of, out of trespassers. In our system, and according to the treaty written by your government, state that, that it is ours. So it is, then it, the responsibility is on, upon the federal government and the state government to make sure those white people who own land in western South Dakota aren't gypped like we've been gypped. What, uh, I'm curious to know, what kind of a society then would, uh, would you establish in that nation? One, the individual would have rights. And the 25,000 years experience that we've had in a perfect form of government, spiritually based, would be reinstituted. It's an inherent, or it was an inherent practice among the Indian people, that when a minority disagreed with the majority, that minority moved away. Those that do not choose to be Indians, then, will have to find another way and another alternative. I would be more than happy to let the Yeskas and those that want to go the, with the BIA, to, they can have Pine Ridge Village and White Clay. <laughs> we'll keep it here. Your desire would be to return to the old ways. Uh, the philosophy, I realize, well, I know you don't the, have to tell me the buffalo's no, gone. No, 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 the philosophy, the old, I, don't, I don't mean that, no, no. Right, the philosophy, and adapt it to these days and these times, and it can be done. And why it hasn't been done before is because of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Indian Reorganization Act, which prevents this type of self-determination. I know it's not your fault, you're just doing order, following orders, but I'm, I'm going to demand that that film be uh, taken and destroyed because it's unfair to these people out here. The Bureau of Indian Affairs police were out the side door taking pictures of everybody who came into the hall. And uh, I have requested and I've received the cameras and the film that they were using. And I'm going to personally destroy the negatives and the film itself. And if I ever hear of another practice like this going, of a, of, a, of a police state, of a police state atmosphere being established on this or any other Indian reservation while I'm in the Congress and while I have the power to do anything about it, that I intend to exercise the full power that I have and that of the United States Congress and put a stop to it.
because this is the United States of America. This is not Hitler's Germany or Papadopoulos's Greece or anything else. This is still the United States of America. Orders. Orders. Higher up. They just issued cameras and said start taking pictures. Who was it that gave you the order? Dell Eastman, the special officer here. He's ahead of the whole law enforcement. But we're just following orders. The television screens, of course, are for the protection of the prisoners that we have in, in jail, and also so the operators sitting up here can view what is happening back into the jail portion. We've had some, uh, some attempted suicides, and uh, as you know, our suicide rate on the, uh, on the reservation is, is quite high, you know, in comparison uh, at our national level. <laughs> We Indian people, my, and I consider myself, have a, a tremendous uh, responsibility on, on ourselves. And now we're, a number of us, of course, are asking other people to come and give us certain things. But I also see a, a tremendous need for input from us and into, uh, into uh, the blending of our culture, you know, into, into your so-called culture. I, uh, uh, I have no argument with the people who went into Wounded Knee. Uh, their, their philosophy, their basic philosophies, I agree with. Uh, I looked on Wounded Knee as simply a, a, a bridge of law enforcement and as my responsibility to try to correct this situation. Uh, not saying that I have accepted the white man's way of life 100%, but uh, I, in the present situation, I tried to utilize what, what they could offer and what my culture could, could offer me. Uh, Ramon is a uh, lawyer. How would you state your demand directly to the American people? <coughs> Free the American Indian from bureaucracy. <laughs> Is that the extent of how you do it? Well, I might add, honor our treaties also. <laughs> What's happened is that the division, the factionalism, the fighting that they're doing is a result of Bureau of Indian Affairs policies over the last hundred years. They've done it deliberately. They've divided them and factionalized them to keep them weak so that the BIA can remain strong. It's just a political, it's balkanizing more than yeah. anything else. It's been this way as long as I can remember, and I imagine it'll still be that way when I die. <laughs> the way things are going, it'd probably just die like the buffalo did. We go back to the earth, down in the since we're too down with it. There's not going to be any earth. And who killed them? No matter how bad things look, I've always had a hope. Not even that up. It's going to be a trick. We'll correct a lot of Wrong. Russell, do you think that Aberrest hearing is going to yield anything? Nope, I never had any faith in hearings. None whatsoever. Senate, congressional, they never accomplish anything. Just food for files, that's all they accomplish. Now, just because another government official came out here and, and, and listened to, and used a tape recorder to listen to some, some gripes, doesn't mean anything's going to change. It's just, either we're sovereign, and solve our own problems, or we're always going to have to be depending on the government. Oh.
Okay. 